It's crude, it's trashy, it ain't too classy, it's Hangover Radio. Alright, you sexy bastards. <clears throat> Mark Zolo here. No, you know what? Thank you for all the positive comments on the last podcast. You know I hadn't done a podcast in so long since New York City. And I felt like doing one one night after a couple of drinks, and I did. And, you know, good feedback, good positive comments. Uh, talked about life in the Med versus New York City. For anyone who hasn't listened, I recommend you go back and check it out. Uh, one of the commenters in the YouTube channel was asking me to do a podcast on turning 30. Because those of you who would have listened last time, uh, I was talking about uh, next weekend I'm turning 30. And I'm going to Iceland. I got friends from three continents flying in, my family as well. And it's going to be my 100th country. And also my last country to visit in Europe. So a milestone in a lot of ways for me and I'm really looking forward to it. But, I mean, 30, what's it like to turn 30? I mean, I'm sure younger guys are very interested in this. And even guys my own age, um, you know, we have a tendency as men to kind of measure up against our peers. And we look back at our, our life and see what we've achieved so far. And in many ways, it is this milestone. 30 seems to be that tipping point for a lot of people. I think it, there's a lot more pressure on women when, when they hit 30, you know, if I was, I was just talking to to a girl about this recently, and uh, it's it's a. I think when you turn thirty, it's there's a lot more weight for women, you know, in terms of mating prospects because the whole biological clock thing. But I'm not gonna get into that. I, for a guy, it's completely different. I mean, turning thirty, I I feel good. I feel good. I honestly do. Um, it's a little bit weird to say, you know. 30 you know it makes you feel a bit older but looking back I'm quite happy with what I did in my 20s you know I lived a quite an amazing life in my 20s I traveled all around the world had all these amazing experience experiences you know wrote a book and um, yeah I, I look I look back on it with fondness but definitely you change a lot I think when you start hitting your uh, late 20s and you're coming up to 30 your mindset completely changes it's actually quite fascinating i remember when i was uh like early 20s and one of my uncles said to me you know you are who you are for the rest of your life when you're in your early 20s that's when you're you're you know you're fully developed and your personality is fully formed and that's the way you go through life bullshit i call it bullshit it's not true there was a, you know, we all have these moments in our, in our lives, whether we could read a book or we go through some serious shit where we develop and grow as people. But I, I think that that constantly happens. I, I think those who do feel like their personality is formed in their younger years tend to be people who are just adverse to growth. And you know a lot of people like that. A lot of people in your life are stubborn. They won't change. They won't fucking hit the gym. They won't read a book. They're just stagnant. They fall into that bullshit matter of be yourself, bro. You gotta just be yourself. Fuck that. Be your best self. That's not even good enough. You need always gotta strive to improve. No matter what, if you're 50 or 15. Now go to, like, I, I probably, uh, I probably should share some of my own experiences about you know these growth changes just to give you some bit of context to where I am now. So there was a couple of stages in life um, where I went underwent a, a period of traumatic growth. Uh, first thing when I was like 14, I used to be one of those rebel rocker kids, you know, long black hair and fucking spots all over my face and big chubby. I was like total rebel, like, like learned to play the guitar, I was into like corn and Marilyn Manson, still awesome bands by the way. But I had like that kind of rebel stage that, you know, people often do in their teens. <coughs> and what I, what I started to do is, I, I actually got arrested uh, for, for making counterfeit money. Yeah, I used to, like back in the day when Ireland had the punts, they were, that was a currency before the euro. Uh, 
they were really uh, rudimentary type of currency. You know, the notes were pretty easy to forge. And I was pretty good in the computer uh, when I was younger. I was pretty savvy. It wasn't very hard to replicate them. And I, I made, uh, it was a Christmas party at my house. Uh, my parents used to have these huge Christmas parties back in the house. It was brilliant. They had a hundred people there with black tie. I remember them with fondness. But um, I remember for one of these parties, I made like a 20 euro, a 20 pound, 20 pound note, Irish pound note. And I used to like hand them out to guests so they can light cigars with it, you know. But everyone was like, God, these are so good. These, these look realistic. And I, I, so I had a bit of a, Bit of a devious plan, and I, I started to print them and sell them in school. But uh, one day, unfortunately, um, some guys bought some money off me, and they, they, the idiots decided to spend that money in the school cafeteria. Uh, now it actually passed; he got food. But when they were counting the money up later, uh, they realized, "Wait a minute, this isn't uh, this isn't real." I mean, they looked a bit darker, and if you know, the feel was different. And there was only so many, they, like, you know, there was like three or four people who handed in uh, 10 pound notes that day. So it wasn't very hard to find a culprit. And it went back to me, house got raided. I had a, I was, I, I fucking ended up in the police station. I had a junior, uh, we had JLO, as we say in Ireland, like a liaison officer appointed to me for a couple of months. And, oh God, it was, and as part of the conditions of, uh, you know, my punishment was I had to go see a school counsellor. And I, I remember it was during religion class. Religion class was mandatory in Ireland. Uh, it still is. It still is. Uh, but it's kind of a DOS class where you watch videos and bullshit like that. You don't really learn anything about religion. But uh, during those classes, I used to have to see a counsellor. And it was very interesting for me because it started off as counselling, but it started to turn into kind of uh, conversations or lessons almost on psychology. Uh, he, he was talking about, you know, Freudian ideas on repression, oppression, and why I was acting out as a teenager. No, I, I was shit at school. Like, all I wanted to do was like, drop out and just start a band, man. You know, just smoke pot and make music. I'm be so famous one day. You know, the way you're a fucking an idiot when you're 14, but... Uh, and I started to get really interested anyway in this psychology stuff. And my counsellor, uh, he, he was brilliant now. He, he used to give me books on Freud and Jung. And then I got really interested in all that stuff. Then I got interested in, you know, philosophy. He used to give me stuff on like Plato, Aristotle and Socrates. And I couldn't get enough of it. And physics, you know, Stephen Hawkins and all, all this type of like deep, deep information that they weren't teaching in school. Real, real education. It was, I, I was just, I was in love with it. And I became a total nerd. I, I totally flipped the switch. I became really good at school. I was getting A's. I ended up, uh, you know, getting the lead in the school musical and fucking got the highest, uh, one of the highest academic awards in the country. I got a scholarship to my university. I, we, had this, we have this thing called Angashka, which is the President's Award in Ireland. And we have three levels, you know, bronze, silver, and gold. And I did all of them. I, oh, I did the gold and... I got the highest result in the country. Um, it, like it, I make it sound like it's super a super smart thing, but it was very holistic. You know, you had to do like a kind of adventure thing, which was that's why I ended up going to Antarctica actually. Um, and also, you know, you to, I teach first aid. I used to be part of St John's Ambulance, and I used to play uh, sports like soccer and stuff. There was, there was it was a lot of things to this. Uh, it was a great program, fantastic. Um. And I, I ended up uh, having dinner with our president, President Mary McAleese, and Prince Philip, uh, who's married to the Queen of England. I don't know why he's not king. I don't know how that works out. Why is he not King Philip if he's married to the Queen? What the fuck is with that bloodline or something? I don't know. Apparently he's crazy racist, but uh, whatever. But it was the first time uh, we had a joint ceremony with Ireland and Northern Ireland. Uh, and uh, I represented Ireland. They, they, I was the speaker there. I got to speak in front of hundreds of people, and they had someone from Northern Ireland. And it was quite an occasion. So at eighteen, I felt like I was top dog, uh, you know, for from age. And um, so I totally, I totally changed uh, when I was fourteen over that really bad incident. Um, and then I got into really into entrepreneurship when I was sixteen. During this period of growth, I ended up representing my county, like me. 
um, I'm going to the All Ireland for an entrepreneurship competition. A friend of mine, uh, Cormac Moore, who is a national radio broadcaster in Ireland, he's he got his like face on the side of buses now. I used to actually have a regular slot on Irish radio on Mondays with the Naughty Nomad stuff. Um, but yeah, so him and me, we, we had this, we started doing concerts and stuff like that. And we used to make like two, three grand a night. Now they were, they were very rare. We used to use our school's public liability insurance. But we were ma- for a 16 year old, when you're making two grand a night, it was fucking insane, you know? Um, and anyway, when we were all grown up and then we tried to get our own public liability insurance, it was like, it's five grand for the night, lads. Suddenly it wasn't so profitable. But I, I remember reading a book uh, by Robert Kawasaki, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Very influential book for me. Cashflow Quadrant was the name of the book. I think it was his second book, Robert Kawasaki's second book. And I was just all about entrepreneurship then. I just wanted to get, I want to be a millionaire before 25. That was my, my thing. And then, and then. Then I discovered travel. Yep. That's where it all kind of fucked up. Because, you know, in my head, and I think a lot of people said, you know, what, what do you want out of life? What is your dreams? What's your aspirations? A lot of people, when you say to them, well, you know, most people, what they do is they, they work really hard till their retirement and they, they save and they, you know, buy a house and they get married, do all the stuff. And then they think, you know, then I'll retire and travel and, you know, live large and follow my dreams then. But when I was 19, I, I took a flight to Thailand I mean, some of you guys have read about this in my first book, uh, Naughty Nomad, Not Your Typical uh, Backpacker Story. For those of you guys who haven't read it, it's gotten fucking fantastic reviews. Check it out on Amazon. But uh, when I was 19, I started traveling and I was in Cambodia and Vietnam and Laos and Thailand. And then I discovered that with just a small amount of money, you can actually live like a fucking rock star in these places. If you're like a relatively decent looking white guy and you go to Southeast Asia, you're gonna drink every night, party fucking hardcore, and you're gonna have women hanging off you. Like, I, it was the first time, I mean, I was sleeping with women that I, I just, I never thought in my wildest dreams I would yeah, sleep with. Just really just beautiful, you know, tan little bodies. They were just all so feminine and gorgeous. I thought I was in heaven. I was like, holy shit. And I'm, I'm spending like a thousand euros a month. It's like, I don't need to get rich to live the lifestyle I want. Fuck that. Fuck that. Why would I, what, what's, what's the point? I mean, this is, this is the end goal. I can have the end goal. I could work in a fucking KSC if I wanted. And I'll save up a couple of grand during the year and then travel for three months. If you're, if you only spend like, I guess in US dollars, you yeah, yeah, you know, at the time it was $1,215, $1,500 a month. You can live like a fucking king and, in like, you know the likes of Latin America, Africa, South uh, Southeast Asia. And that's what I did. You know, I I went to college, and I wouldn't go out when I was in college. I would just every you know every night that my friends were going out, I'd be like, well, I could go out and spend a hundred euros because you know Ireland's not very cheap, or that's three days in fucking Southeast Asia. That's what I used to think of it like that. So I used to save up, uh, doing odd jobs. It was DJing, which is fucking brilliant. It was a great job, by the way. Fucking hell, it's great. And I'd be making, you know, 130 euros a night doing that. Uh, and I, I work in bars. I was doing a lot of graphic design work. But I, whatever hustle I could, all self-employed now. Uh, I just stashed that cash. You know, I was living at home. Uh, I'd drive to college. Uh, just carry expenses. That was it. And then I'd save up all the money. And I'd travel for three months during the summer. And that's how we did all Cairo to Cape Town, Moscow, Manila. I traveled all over the world. Had an amazing, adventurous lifestyle. I was, I got into all these crazy situations, and I was pretty sad, you know. And then I did my masters, and then I came to New York, and that's where shit changed again. So that brings us closer to the present day. So I was traveling around, and I I I read my first book. I think I was twenty five at the time. And I was doing the Caribbean and I decided to visit my brother in New York. He was living there. Uh, I said, I'll, I'll live there for three months. That's what I thought. And fuck, I loved New York City. You know, I, I, I fell in love. I was, 
I was living a life there that I, in my wildest dreams I couldn't imagine. Because, you know, in New York City, if you're a bartending, because that's what I've been doing all my life, my parents, I grew up above a pub, and my, uh, that was the business that my family was in. And so I got, it was easy to get bar jobs, even though technically wasn't supposed to work there. If you're an Irish guy uh, in New York, there's lots of Irish bars that hire you. And you make fucking money in New York if you're a bartender. You're talking like, on average, $200 a night. Uh, you know, this, I remember I worked gay pride in Greenwich Village once. I made $800 in a day one time. So that's fucking money. And with an Irish accent in New York, you fucking clean up with women. It was a bit ridiculous, actually. I felt like a beautiful woman. It was just uh, debauchery. And all these different flavors, Latinas and you know, African Americans and anything you could get your hands on it. New York City, it's fucking New York City. And I felt like the bell of the ball. You know, it, in most of the world, bartending is looked down upon. But in New York City, if you say you're a bartender, they're like, oh shit. Because if, you, if you're going to be a bartender in New York City, you got to be, you know, you got to be good looking. You got to have charm, you got to have skill. You got to know what you're fucking doing and you get paid for it. And it's viewed as like a high status profession because you're making career money. You know, you're making 50, 50 plus grand a year in a decent job. So that was great. And I was, and I actually settled down for the first time. And that's when the next change happened. That's when the next change happened. Of course, there was, there's incremental changes before that, you know, uh, I read like the way a man with Jack Donovan, I got into fitness, changed my body and all that kind of thing. But they, they were minor tweaks, you know, I, I always did relatively well with with women, even though I was kind of like a, a bit of a fucking fat slob, but uh, but that, that was, I changed my mentality there because it was fun for the first three months and then I had to go home and get my visa. Because, uh, you know, like they give you a, a working visa for America if you if you graduate within a year. So I took my master's, so it was my, my last chance. It was my only chance to actually legitimately live and work in America. So I took it. Uh, interestingly enough, at the same time, a Mai Tai gym in Thailand, like one of the guys, they were really interested in my blog, man, you know, man. and he said, you know, come over to Thailand, we will train you for free, you can live for, for free for three months, you do a documentary about it, you promote the gym, it's a win-win. And I was like, oh shit, that sounds so fucking cool. But I thought to myself, God, this is the only chance I have to live in America. So I chose that. I said, I could always go back to Thailand. You know, that, that was still on the card. It's not now, but um, cause I ended up staying there for two years, but uh, I took I took it. And what happened was, it was quite interesting. So I went through this period of debauchery and, you know, dating tons of women, threesomes and uh, like, you know, stupid stuff, like shagging three different races in a day. Like I, I was kind of just, I took it to the extreme, you know, it, it, was, it was like everything I had to level up on. It was like ego sex, man. It was ego sex. I, I think I, I wrote a really good post about this before. Uh, flagging, is it healthy? You can Google it. But um, so, like, I mean, think everyone goes in their twenties. Guys think, guys think. So, I actually let's let's bring this back a bit. So, the first thing I thought was money. That was the goal. And then I thought, well, money is the goal only because I want to live a lifestyle where I'm basically, you know, living large, you know, drinking and partying, just banging everything that moves. Because I thought that was the the end goal. And then I got to that, you know, I was doing that. Uh, and, you know, guys go through the notch phase in their early 20s where they're like, oh, I have to score so many birds. And I took it to the next level. I was like, and it was nationalities, started getting nationalities. And I was, I think by 25, it's separate, like, women from 50 different countries. Like, yeah, I'm the fucking man at this. And the worst bit was, I was getting a lot of respect from people, like, people online and stuff. They were like, oh, you're that guy who is, you know, a fucking master flagger man whore. And I got respect for that, so I thought, yeah, this is, this is, this is my thing. It, I, my identity became wrapped up in that. I, I, um, the last poster wrote, you guys should really read it, it's called um, Becoming Imprisoned by a Persona. So I basically, I was never that way inclined, but because of my online persona, my online personality, I kind of found myself just being trapped in that persona. I kind of became a victim of it in a way. And uh, I was just doing it for the sake of doing it. But the thing was, after a while, I didn't derive satisfaction from it. I wasn't happier. You know, 
back in the early days, you know, when I was in my early 20s, when I used to get a new flag or an exotic flag, like, yeah, man, I fucking did it. It was like a secret mission. I felt like James Bond. I'd go to somewhere like Oman or his team. I was like, I'm going to get this fucking flag. I'm going to get this flag. And I worked with the Trojan. I'd be online, messaging girls, going out at night, approaching girls like a demon. And I'd get the result and I'd be like, yeah, fuck yeah, I'm fucking so cute. But it was fleeting. And the more I did it, the more I, the, it just became, man. Yeah. You know, I'd wake up in the morning, I wouldn't feel any different, I wouldn't feel any joy. I didn't derive satisfaction from it. And then I was like, well, what's missing, you know? What is, this is what every guy wants to do, right? And I'm doing it, but I'm not happier. And that was a kind of strange to me, I was like, what's next? So I decided to stop it. I decided to stop the whole flagging thing, and I was just like, go with... You know, pick go for quality over quantity, and that's when I started to kind of develop meaningful relations. Uh, meaning, sorry, meaningful relationships with women. I I got into. I was living with a, a Russian girl for a while in New York for I've seen her for eight months, um, and and like when I say a relationship, it wasn't like your typical relationship. It was like. She wouldn't sleep with anyone else, but she let me sleep with other girls and be threesomes and that kind of thing. And I had total freedom, but I was seeing some long term and emotionally it was it was a deep relationship. You know, I felt connected and there was a lot of love there. It was good. It was positive. And then I after that, that's a really funny story how how that kind of transpired. But anyway, I ended up seeing somebody else, a Caribbean girl. And she actually moved here to Malta with me. We were seeing each other for two and a half years. And again, that wasn't exactly a non-traditional relationship, but it did develop into a semi-monogamous relationship where if I was having sex with another girl, she had to be there essentially, you know. We'd, we'd bring a girl back together. And that didn't happen that often. But I'm making it sound like I'm a pure player, but it happened occasionally. I got my kicks. And I felt satisfied. You know, I, I didn't feel the need to, uh, after a while, just to bang random chicks. I really didn't. I'm not being truthful. At the start, it was different. At the start, it was am ambiguous. Yeah, ambiguous. And, you know, there'd be a few bathroom romps in New York City and that kind of thing. Man, I was so good at bathroom sex. I, I, had, I had this skill in New York of meeting a girl in, within an hour of chatting to her in the bathroom. Game over. Pat myself on the back there. God, see, there's that ego again, right? Does that ever die? I don't know. But anyway, and now it's, I, 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 I talked about the last podcast. That's over. My relationship is over. And I'm single again. And now I'm just ah, taking a breather. Taking a breather. My interest in going out and partying and bagging everything and moves, that's not there. I, I don't know if that's lower testosterone, I'm coming on 30, but I just have different priorities now. Now I'm actually back to where I was about, you know, my finances. Because what I realize is, what I really want is freedom. And if you really want freedom, you gotta have financial freedom. And it's, like I used to think I was, free by being self-employed, but that's not real freedom because you're giving your time up, you're giving a lot of effort up. Like even blogging and writing books, I mean, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a shit blogger, man. I I, look, I, I write good stuff some, from time to time, but I'm so inconsistent. I just write when I feel like it, like once a week-ish, once every two weeks. It, like it's it's time, it's all time. Time is the ultimate currency. Um, and I, But I realize it's passive income, that's what you want. You want your money to work for you. So that's where I'm at right now. I'm turning 30 and that's where, that, I'm thinking long term. I'm thinking long term. Why I didn't think of the long term game earlier, it's pretty simple. I, I mean, anyone who's read my book uh, will remember a story when I was 20 years old. Uh, I slept with a woman in Uganda who after we had sex, uh, we, we couldn't find it. It was like one in the morning or something like that. As you can imagine, 
Uganda doesn't have a lot of convenience stores open at 1 a.m. Yeah, we couldn't find condoms, we slept together, and afterwards she told me she had HIV. I was very uneducated about the disease at the time. I was convinced I would definitely get it, and fuck, I'm done. I'm fucking done. Like 10 to 15 years. And the worst bit is you have to wait three months to get tested. So uh, those three months were the worst months of my life. Fuck, they were shit. I remember just thinking, God, if I had only 10, 15 years left in my life, what would I do? Forget about family. Forget about a career. I mean, what's the point? I mean, I've still finished college. Um, well, I don't know. If I, if, if I got the results back, I don't mind. If, and it was it ended up being positive. I might have not done college. But um, I remember thinking, if I had only 10, 15 years left in my life, what would I do? And it, straight away, what came to my head was travel every fucking country in the world. Just go everywhere and experience it all, you know. Experience everything that life has to offer. Three months passed, got my results back, and I was clean, clean bill of health. But that thought still stuck, and that mentality, it just stuck. So I kept living that life like I was gonna, gonna die soon. I mean, I could, 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 have, gotten, could have gotten hit by a, by a bus, you know, the next day. I mean, you never know when fucking death's gonna creep up on you anyway. So why not live life like that? Live fast. And then, so, and I was, tra I was traveling to like 10, 15 countries a year at one stage. I was really living fast. I was only kind of when I was around 27, just before New York. I was looking back and like, holy shit, I've been to like 80 something, 90 something countries. <coughs> Chill, dude. I mean, what happens if you actually achieve that goal and you're 35 and you've traveled every country in the world? What the fuck are you going to do then? God, you're going to be so bored. You know, what's around the corner? Like, you're just gonna <laughs> fucking teach yourself. It's like banging fucking the cold shares in here and then like losing a leg and you're dating fives. That, that's an awful metaphor, but uh, <laughs> you know you know what I'm trying to say. You know what I'm trying to say. Actually, one of my mates banged through cold shares in here. True story. Yeah. But that's 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 a private conversation. That's fine. She wouldn't. I asked him for pictures, but apparently she would. She wouldn't allow any pictures to be taken. That guy, he was a male model. He was a fucking shredded, man. Uh, it's, it's not a job for mere mortals. <sighs> anyway. Where was it? Oh, yes, of course. So I, I decided at 27. I could slow down a bit. Relax. That's why I decided to settle in New York City. I'm not in a rush. I've, I've gotten a lot of countries out of the way. Um, and that mentality continued over here when, I just, when my visa essentially ended, uh, moved over to the Mediterranean, and I moved over to Malta, as I was saying uh, last week. You can make really good money here in tech as a freelancer or whatever, and I got, I, my, I got a lot of experience in animation and graphic design, that kind of thing, and I can make a killing over here. I have a lot of passive income streams as well, like minor, minor things, not enough to, I could live in Pakistan and Karachi or something on my passive income, but it's not enough to, to you know, I'm a fucking alcoholic. If I if I go cruising around Latin America, Africa, I'm gonna go on the piss every single night, and that shit's not it's not cheap. I I am not into the whole ultra budget travel. It's just not me. I I can't do dorm rooms anymore. Uh, like I'm gonna have my own place. Like what's the point in fucking getting a dorm room and, and and you know, cooking in and not going out and drinking? What's the fucking point? You want to have your own place because if you're gonna meet a girl, you're not gonna bring her back to your fucking dorm room. I mean, you're going to drink, if you want to go out and meet people and have a social life, you know, you're going to drink and you're going to spend money. And that cost, it, you know, you, you got to have a decent passive income stream to live that kind of lifestyle. So right now I'm, I'm stacking cash, I got a good bit saved and I'm going to invest it and I'm going to build my passive income. And when, it, when I hit my number, then I can do whatever the fuck I want. And live life in how I choose to see fit, you know. And I got some really cool plans that I haven't talked about publicly. But I got some really cool shit in the works for what I want to do and how I want to live my life. And it's not like your typical digital nomad stuff. It's something completely different. Something I've been thinking about for a long time. And, and 
people who know me and have talked to me will know what I'm talking about. So 30s, yeah, that's 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 where I'm at. That's what it's like. Just thinking about my future a bit more, being a bit more sensible. Um, God, I sound so fucking boring right now. But I do want to return to the road. Yeah, I do. I I still got that in me. It's just subdued, you know. I'm playing the long game because you can't as much you could, you know, work your job, travel, work your job, travel. You could find a setup. I mean, people go into teaching. My cousin went into teaching just for that. He went into it. To, to live that lifestyle so he can travel for two, three months a year. I mean, and I don't look down on people who do that. If you want to be someone like a teacher, I mean, it's a pretty sweet gig. You're working, you know, for what, you know, nine, ten months a year. I don't know what it's like in the States, but it's pretty good in Ireland. You get three months off in the, the summer. If you're a secondary school teacher, that would be a high school teacher in America. Or if you're doing primary, it's two months. You can do a lot of travel and then you got Christmas and Easter. You can see a lot. You can have a really good life. I would never look down on someone for doing that. I think it's fucking cool. It's better than working a nine to five and getting two weeks off here. Can you fucking imagine getting two weeks off here? It's actually, that's one thing that sucks about the States. You know, I love America. I love, I love it. But they don't, they're not really good with the holidays. I mean, over here, you're talking about 24 days off and public holidays in Sweden. I think they give like a 28 days off. It's, it's not ideal, but it's still a lot more than you, it's a lot more than two weeks. And I think in China and Korea, it's fucking worse to get ten days. And Japan is the same, fucking miserable. No wonder everyone's fucking killing themselves. God. Another thing I mixed about Europe is the cheap flights. I think I mentioned that uh, last time. Just you can, if you want, even here, if it's a weekend, it costs you ten, twenty euros. You're flying around to some fucking cool city, Eastern Europe, beautiful women, cheap booze. You're handy dandy, lots of variety. It's a good lifestyle. It's a good lifestyle. I wonder how much testosterone plays. I know, I think that I'm maturing and I don't know, it's quality over quantity. I'm thinking about, God, is it just my, my T levels going down? Uh, is it just that? Like, I definitely don't have the same sexual appetite I had in my early 20s. Is it just my T levels? Or. Is it just because I've gotten that out of the way? I'm an ego, I say it. It's probably a combination of the two. I mean, how do you raise your T levels? You know, there's three ways I can think of off the bat that are not chemical. And I'm pretty much hitting all of them. I mean, I'm doing martial arts and doing jiu jitsu. I actually got my first competition uh, next month or two months away in Europe. I'm going to get my fucking ass handed to me because uh, I didn't realize it was a gi competition, which is the suits. Uh, and I, I've been practicing non gi for the last two months. Uh, I just ordered my gi, but I'm not gonna have any time to, to practice. So I'm definitely gonna have my ass kicked at every belt I had. But you know, it's gonna be a good experience. But the, you know, martial arts and especially the likes of jiu-jitsu, you're going 100, uh, percent and it's really good for your T levels. I mean, you have days where you'll get choked out by all the better guys, and you'll you'll fucking oh shit, and you'll come out with your head down low. But then you'll have those nights where. You know, you get one of the good guys and you fucking, you, you just pull the right move, you get an arm bar or something and you choke that motherfucker out and you feel like a gorilla. You're coming out there, thumping your chest, like, oh, yeah. You can feel it. You can feel it. And of course, the next biggest thing, the biggest thing for me is, you know, heavy lifting. You know, squats and deadlifts. God, like, I, 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 it frustrates me when I see guys, now when I see guys who don't lift, I'm like, oh, you have to lift, man. Like, people think it's, it, I don't get the mentality of people who don't want to improve their bodies now. I, I mean, I was like that for age. I was getting laid. I had no problem getting laid without doing all that stuff. But, I mean, it's so good for your mood. Just your mood, your happiness in general. You feel good and your body feels good. And you look better. You look in the mirror, you're like, fuck yeah, you're sexy. You know when your fucking girls, they're fucking coming all over your dick. They're going, yeah, look at that fucking body. Yeah, they're loving it. And that gets you off. It's so good for your sex life. It's so good for everything. You know, you gotta hit the gym. You really, you really gotta do some lifting. It's so, it's challenging and it's, it can be tough sometimes. And I know you can be reluctant to go to the gym. It takes a lot of willpower, but the rewards are so worth it. They're so worth it. And for, by the way, if anyone's not into lifting, um, you know, it, it can seem a bit daunting at first. I really recommend strong lifts, five by five, 
uh, you can look it up on, on Google. That's a really, really good program. I did that for a year and I noticed huge results in the first six months. Uh, it's a really good program to get into. Um, and if you're interested in, even if you're, if you're not into lifting, just improving your body in general, also I recommend lean gains. It talks about intermittent fasting and all that kind of stuff. Really good material on there about diet because diet's a big thing. Uh, if you want to improve your body, just, just look at lean gains. It's, a, it's, it's good. Anyway, yeah, so, so, and then of course, the third thing for T levels is sex. Yeah, having sex with a new partner, I, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure on the, you know, the novelty factor if you're, if it's a new partner or the same partner, like how that, the difference in the T level increase. But, you know, sex, sex is great for your testosterone levels. So, martial arts, heavy lifting, and sex, they're great for your T level. So, I'm doing all these things that I didn't do in my mid 20s. So, that should probably count as the T level. So, it's probably more down to the maturity thing. Oh, I'm rambling a bit, but that's what you do when there's no one else here to, to check you and you're speaking to the microphone by yourself. It's a weird thing to do doing a podcast by yourself, but it, it's, not, it's not as hard as I thought. That's one thing I've actually gotten really into is podcast now because my work is all design based now. And the good thing about design work or visual work like that. If you're writing content or you're a writer, you can't really listen to stuff like podcasts or you know, do language lessons or anything like that because if, I don't know about for you guys, but I can't write or read while I'm listening to something. I can only hear because I'm one of these people when I read, uh, I say, I, I speak it in my head. And if I hear all these different voices in my head where, you know, if there's a podcast going on, I'm reading, I, I can't process it. But with visual work, I can just work and I'm processing everything that I'm listening to. And I'm listening to like a lot of Joe Rogan. He, he's got a great podcast, Radio Lab. Uh, Tim Ferriss, fantastic. And I also have my guilty pleasures with like, you know, Matt Forney and, Ma- Matt Forney and Milo and um, Cernovich and a couple of those guys. All great, man. Podcasts are great. And that's why I kind of start doing them again because you can get so much value and information from, uh, like, rather, like, you can read a book and stuff, but there's something about watching videos and listening to things that, you can kind of just sit back and not think about it and you just kind of absorb it a bit more. You get into it when you're reading, but I don't feel like you absorb it as much. Or you, you, might, you might absorb it as much, but you kind of have to concentrate a bit more. Yeah. But for any, any guys who feel like you don't have the time to read books, because I don't read nearly as much as I should, but you know, podcasts and YouTube and stuff is, is, are great alternatives. A really great alternative. Right, I, I, I'm thinking about where to go next. Anything else about turning 30 about lifestyle? Like, I, lifestyle, listen, I said I can't do the drawing. I have a bit more of a uh, taste for the finer things in life, I'm not going to lie. That's another thing about getting a bit older. But I was in New York, I was renting a room, had roommates. Now, I can't even do the roommate thing. I've got like, I'm in a duplex overlooking the sea. It's like, i got my own space. It's a beautiful space. I'm living a really nice life. And... I enjoy, I enjoy that. I don't know if I can go back to the roommate thing. And you spend a bit more, but fuck it, man. Hopefully you're in a position where you're making a bit more. You know, if you've developed a skill set, you should be making a bit more when you're, when you're 30. And if you're not, if you're, if you're coming into your 30s, fuck a university education. Like I have a master's. I don't use any of that shit for, for what I do to make money. You got YouTube. Any skill you, you can learn, you can learn off YouTube. Whether it be fucking carpentry or graphic design or video editing. I mean, even like TEFLs and teaching English, like people teach all around the world. They, that shit, they can do it all online. They can do it all online. I mean, universities are becoming obsolete, in my opinion. Education is important. Um, but you know, I grew up in Ireland. When I grew up in Ireland, it was Celtic Tiger time, and the economy is good. And university was practically free. It was like eight hundred euros a, a year just to re- for registration fees, and that was it. Like I think if I was in, and I only applied for one course in Ireland cause, because I decided I want to do this course. It was like venture management, it was kind of like entrepreneurship. Uh, and I said, if I don't get in a course, I won't do college because I'm not going to waste my time. Uh, but if I was in the states and I was facing like fucking. 10 grand, 20 grand 
It goes up to 50 grand a year. Fuck no! Hell no, that wouldn't have been a thought in my head. Unless I had like super rich parents that would be paying for it. No fucking way. Get yourself, like, what a terrible way to start life. If you come out of your education, you got a hundred grand in debt. Fuck that. What a fucking joke, man. For all that time in four years, you could be working in a shitty job. Save up all that cash during four years, invest it in something. That seems like a smarter move. You know, trades and all that stuff are so undervalued. Yeah, and looked down upon. I, it's, it's a shame. It's a real shame. It's a real snobbery thing. And, but, I mean, when you think about it, is it a snobbery thing? It's probably a mating thing. Because women now are so highly educated. Because women don't do trades. And if you want to succeed in the mating game, you feel like, you know, you got to be higher status. And that, unfortunately, people equate that with your education. So it's bald. But that's the game, man. That's the game. That's reality. I'm, I'm probably, I'm probably rambling a bit now. I think I'll, I'll leave it there, guys. But I want to tell you about what's, what's in the pipeline. I got a, some really cool interviews uh, lined up, the next couple of podcasts, and um, some of the usual subjects. JJ Roberts, I might get Matt Forney on there. Um, I also got uh, Andrew McLeod. He's a, he was an Australian uh, politician. Boy, well, the guy's got like. 50,000 followers on Twitter, but he's written like published a digit book, not self published. He's a he just um, talks all around the world, extremely well traveled guy. Been to a couple of hundred or been a couple of hundred, do you hear me? But he's been over a hundred countries. A uh, really interesting guy. He's very left, left wing, which I think would be an interesting contest because a lot of guys in who are interested in manosphere content, as you know, they they have right leanings, and I'm, I'm a libertarian kind of a little conservative libertarian I, I'd be sort of uh, that way inclined but I think it'd be really interesting to get another perspective on it because this guy he, he wrote a book of all about um, aid he was an aid worker uh, or, or he advised the UN on aid or something like that um, and he'll give it, I thought it'd be interesting for you guys to get a fresh perspective um, we'll cross hairs on certain things but I, I feel like a conversation would be really interesting and he, he's a big he's a big naughty you know, nomad fan he would never admit that publicly, but uh, we met in uh, the Campbell apartment, in, in which is a kind of a secret speakeasy in in the Grand Central Station in New York City. Check it out, guys! It's really cool, it's fantastic. But uh, yeah, we met for a point there, and I'll be delighted to have him on the show. Who else? Uh, Kyle from This Is Trouble. Uh, this is a guy. He's, he's another really well-traveled guy with a blog, a uh, kind of a digital nomad. Uh, Krauser as well. Uh, Nick Krauser. Who's who's kind of the opposite to Andrew because he's really he's really white wing, like some of the shit he says on Twitter. I'm like, what the fuck, man? How have you not been banned? You know the way Twitter is so, super social justice now. He says some pretty extreme stuff, but he's good at pick up. You can't deny it. And um, so he'd be an interesting guy to get on. So like, lots of exciting stuff coming on. And uh, anyway, so that's me, guys. Thanks for listening again, Mark Zolo. Now you know how to come, you know the score, check out my book on Amazon, uh, Twitter, at now you know it. Another thing is good, if you really want to keep updated on what I'm doing, I'm, I'm using Instagram a lot now because, you know, I'm a vain motherfucker. That's not, that's not kidding. So, uh, and it, so Instagram suits me, but I really want to build that stuff up. Uh, yeah, and I always do little videos and that kind of thing. So uh, it's like now you know about on Instagram. Uh, and if anyone has any personal queries, don't be afraid to email me uh, at the naughty nomad at gmail.com. But if you really want to get in contact with me, I'm really good with Facebook. The Facebook, if you if you uh, email or message uh, Naughty Nomad on Facebook, I respond almost instantly every time, and I'm pretty good with that kind of stuff. If you if you don't like, just ask some stupid. I get a lot of fucking stupid questions. Like, well, sorry, not to not to be little with some readers, but you know, I always get some guy from you know Bagwakistan who's like, where do I meet the pretty white girls? And oh my god, it's like, dude. Or, you know, like, how much does it cost here? It's like, you know, stuff you can Google. Stuff anyone can Google, but they decide to ask me for God knows what, really. Um, but I got a lot of really cool guys on there. A lot of, I've had a really cool conversation with guys who met up with guys uh, who reach out to me. A lot of my readers tend to be pretty cool. I don't know what it is. I'm very lucky with that. My readers tend to be pretty awesome guys. Uh, and I'll, uh, as I said last podcast, any, anyone in Malta, you know, want to go for a pint, I'm down. Uh, anyway, guys, take care. 
Until next time. Screwed, it's trashy, it ain't too classy, it's hangover radio.